In his 1962 book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, the scientific historian and philosopher Thomas Kuhn described the progress of science as consisting of occasional paradigm shifts, separated by extended periods of normal science, during which investigations are designed and the results interpreted within the reigning conceptual framework. Kuhn also observed that the interregnum continues until two conditions are fulfilled, the first being the accumulation of anomalies, that is, observations that do not fit comfortably within the prevailing paradigm and indicate that the current understanding might be incorrect or incomplete. In molecular genetics, the prevailing assumptions have been, with minor exceptions, that genes encode proteins, that genetic information is transacted and regulated by proteins, and that there is no heritable communication between somatic and germ cells. These assumptions had their roots in the mechanical zeitgeist of the age, in microbial genetics and in theoretical biology. Machines have parts and so do organisms, with the unstated assumption that apart from cis-acting regulatory sequences, no other information is required. Microbial genetics indicated that most mutations occur in proteins, what you might call catastrophic component damage that's easy to track, and of course their genomes are mostly protein coding. In parallel, theoreticians ruminated that if animal and plant genomes are similarly comprised of protein coding genes, the mutational load would be unbearable. So most of these genomes must not code for proteins and ergo must be junk. Now several anomalies have occurred since those early uh, ruminations and uh, conceptual uh, considerations. The first was the so-called C-value paradox or C-value enigma, which basically stated that there were some simple organisms that had far more DNA than more complex organisms which implied that they might be carrying around a load of baggage. Other anomalies, mostly interrelated, followed as the analytical technologies improved. The second was the discovery in 1968 that animal and plant genomes harbour large and variable numbers of repetitive sequences, which were similarly dismissed as junk on the same basis. The third anomaly was that eukaryotic genes are not collinear with their encoded protein products, but are rather mosaics of protein coding and non-coding information, probably the biggest shock in the history of molecular biology. The fourth anomaly was the identification of genetic loci in animals and plants that control the spatiotemporal patterns of gene expression during development, called enhancers. There are hundreds of thousands of cancer loci in the human genome, thought to operate as transcription factor binding sites. The fifth anomaly was a genetic phenomenon dubbed transfection, whereby a wild-type non-coding regulatory element adjacent to a mutant protein coding gene could complement the reciprocal mutant uh, and restore wild-type function. The sixth anomaly was another genetic phenomenon initially described in plants termed transcriptional and post-transcriptional gene silencing which exposed the RNA interference pathway by which small RNAs control not only transposon expression but also uh, gene expression in, uh, in animals and plants. The seventh anomaly was revealed by the genome sequencing projects at the turn of the century. There was no scaling of the number of protein coding genes with the developmental complexity, which was called the G-value enigma. Both nematodes and humans have this roughly the same number of protein coding genes, and many of them are autologous. In parallel, from high throughput transcriptomic analyses conducted in the wake of the genome projects, the eighth, the eighth anomaly was the unexpected finding that plant and animal genomes, genomes are pervasively transcribed to produce large numbers of long non-coding RNAs that derive intronically, intergenically, overlapping and antisense with respect to protein coding genes. The ninth anomaly was a discovery dating back to the 1970s but progressively catalogued during the following decades of a second epigenetic code embedded in the methylation of DNA and the hundreds of modifications of histones that form the nucleosomes around which the DNA is wrapped in eukaryotes. These modifications are differentially and dynamically exposed at thousands, if not millions, of sites around the genome. The tenth anomaly was, which predates all others, but lay dormant until Brink's analyses in the 1950s, is a strange uh, genetic phenomenon called paramutation, first observed as rogue patterns of inheritance by Bateson in 1915. 
Paramutation is best characterized in animals, but also in plants, but also occurs in animals and is now well established to be RNA-directed transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, which was outlawed by the early theoretical biologists. Now Kuhn concluded that a second condition needs to be fulfilled before a paradigm is changed, that an alternative cannot and will not be accepted unless it is both credible and consistent with the established body of knowledge. That is, it must prom promise to preserve a relatively large part of that which has been accrued to science through its predecessors. Now having thought about this, I have come to the realise that the continuing confusion and reluctance to update the conception of genetic programming is because many molecular biologists are invested in the current paradigm and a coherent alternative synthesis has not been offered. In this paper, I tend to do so. Now generally, uh, one can state the new paradigm is that while most genes in unicellular organisms encode proteins, the evolution of multicellular organisms, that's developmentally complex to uh, multicellular organisms, has been accompanied by and dependent on the advent of another class of genes that produce RNAs that act as, act as regulatory molecules to control gene expression, organise nuclear territories and cytoplasmic domains during ontogeny, which in the case of humans involves over 10 to the power of 13 cell fate decisions. That is, genomes contain genes DNA segments that are not necessarily contiguous nor restricted to any one product or function, that specify proteins, peptides, ancillary RNAs and regulatory RNAs, the latter required for the epigenetic control of developmental trajectories and which have expanded with developmental complexity. Now in the rest of the paper, I set out all of the mechanisms by which these uh, RNAs function and explain how each of the anomalies can be explained by this expanded uh, understanding of the nature of genetic information. Just to conclude, genes don't just encode proteins. They encode both proteins and regulatory RNAs, often both, with the latter uh, expanding with developmental complexity and eventually dominating the genetic programming of complex organisms. I hope you enjoyed the paper. Thank you for listening. <laughs>